So let's proceed to our second talk of this morning. Um, so this is this will be a merged talk presented by um, Neil and uh, also presented by Remis. So the first part will be presented by Neil about um, uh, equilibration of non-Markovian quantum process. And the second part will be presented by Ramis about theory of agrotic uh, quantum process. So um, both of you have uh, have 15 minutes. Please just start. All right, thanks very much. Um, yep, my name is Neil Dowling and I'm at Monash University in Australia and I'm a PhD student under the supervision of uh, Kevin Modi. So today I'm going to be talking about the equilibration of non-Markovian quantum processes. So the broad question of what we're concerned with is how to reconcile um, microscopic or fundamentally quantum mechanics with uh, statistical physics results such as thermal ensemble descriptions. And one facet of this question is about equilibration. So how does given that quantum mechanics is, dictates that things constantly evolve, how does, at least in an isolated system, how does stationarity arise from such a continuous evolution? And more specifically, we care about multi-time correlation functions. So in a quantum process, a multi-time correlation function, as shown here, so some density operator and a sequence of um, Heisenberg operators acting at different times, um, these expectation values will generally give you more information about the dy your dynamical system compared to a single time quantum mechanical expectation value. And so regarding equilibration, the question is when do we observe stationary processes? When do these multi-time correlation functions equilibrate, we say, from underlying unitary dynamics? And in fact, this is related to the question of how memory is lost in quantum systems. In, in nature, Markovian phenomena and the Markovian approximation is generally quite accurate. And so what, how do we lose the information of the initial state or the initial process to get to a thermal state in the end? So first, I'll describe more specifically what we mean by quantum process. So consider an isolated system environment uh, evolving unitarily according to a high time independent Hamiltonian. And at si some time T1, we measure the system. So the system is just some hypothetically um, accessible space that an uh, experimenter can access. And they measure the system and necessarily feed the output of that measurement back into the process. And this is where the uh, intricacies of multi-time statistics come into it because measurement in quantum mechanics is necessarily invasive. And so this can be repeated with a different time of unitary evolution and a new measurement at time T2 and so on and so forth until the ex hypothetical experimenter has measured a K time correlation function. So K of these instruments and these instruments are uh, CP maps on the system level. And so if I gather all the unitary dynamics and the initial state into a single object, a single tensor, which we call the process tensor. Um, this is in fact a multilinear map from the set of possible instruments the experimenter could measure with. And so all the dynamics are stored in this single object, which is inaccessible to the experimenter. This is what is happening in the background. And so using this object, we can actually Okay, more formally, it is the choice state of the multilinear map of, from the sequence of instruments. And you can use this to come up with a multi-time generalization of the Born rule. So for a, a multi-time instrument, so the measurement at uh, different points in time, you can compute this expectation value from our previous slide in much the same way as a single time expectation value is computed in quantum mechanics, because this epsilon, this process tensor, is in fact a 2k minus 1 density operator. So it's converted all the temporal correlations into spatial correlations into a big single object that represents the process. And this bulb on A represents the k instruments um, in a single tensor product. Okay, so why are 
process is interesting. And why do we do this? Well, for example, they appear in many contexts, temporal correlation functions and condensed matter and statistical physics. But for us, for example, quantum processes allow us to characterize non-Markovianity in a quantum system independent of the choice of memory device, of measurement device, excuse me. So for Upsilon here, uh, we have our dynamics and initial state encoded in this single quantum term. And, and at some time I can measure with some instrument A minus. And then I have a causal break on the system level. So say this could be an independent repreparation on the system. And then I can say, okay, depending on the outcomes of the measurement A minus, how does that influence the statistics of the expectation value of A plus? And the only way it could possibly influence that is if memory is transferred through the environment, which is exactly what non markovianity is in the quantum uh, in the quantum case. And so then you could optimize over different instruments, A minus and A plus, and come up with a degree of non markovianity of the entire process epsilon. Okay, so but how do we want to use processes here? Well, we want to know, are there non-equilibrium features hidden in the dynamics of a process? Can we say that processes, how, how do they become stationary? Why do, can we say anything about temporal correlation functions and how they look compared to an equilibrium version? So in the single time case, you just get quantum mechanical expectation value. But in the multi-time case, we can have memory effects and uh, non-trivial equilibrium features that may uh, not be are prevalent in the single time case. So to determine what we mean by equilibration of processes, we need to define, we define an equilibrium process. And so for this, we take all the unitary evolutions and we infinite time average over all those times of evolution. And this just corresponds to dephasing between each measurement by the experimenter. So I define this process epsilon corresponding to, so I have some dynamic process, sorry, I have some dynamic process epsilon, and I define the process omega as replacing all the unitary evolution with dephasing. And so this has lost all the time dependencies. So this is, this is the stationary equilibrium process we were looking for. And our result is going to say, under what conditions does this general dynamic process look like this equilibrium process as according to measurements? Um, multi-time measurements. And so our main result says that processes look equilibrium for most times and for typically large many body systems. So more technically, we say that the difference in multi-time, so this, this object here corresponds to this diagram and this object here corresponds to the, the diagram B. So this says that the root mean square of the, or the square of the, the difference in expectation values, multi-time expectation values measured on a process are close to that measured on the equilibrium process. So in other words, the time of the dynamics doesn't matter in certain case. So we have to see when is this valid. And this is the infinite time average, this open bar infinity. So this is, this is why we say for most times, so it's an on average statement. And so looking at the right hand side of this, this brevet A is a technical term that scales, it's less than equal to one and it scales with the operator norms of the individual instruments. Two to the, uh, the, what actually quantifies when this happens or when a statistical description is valid is this effective dimension here, which is um, one over the purity of the dephase state in the energy eigenbasis. Um, and we can say that, okay, and the important part is this effective dimension typically scales exponentially with system size. And so experimentally reasonably, the amount of times an experimenter can measure it is not gonna scale exponentially with the size of the system. If you have a macroscopic system with 10 to the 23, say, uh, particles, you're not gonna be able to measure 10 to the 23 times and determine all the correlations between them. Uh, and in the single time case for this equation, we arrive at the previous equilibration results of single time observables of quantum states as opposed to processes. So as I said before, the effective dimension uh, quantifies this and it says that not all energy eigenstates participate equally in the dynamics. So the effective dimension is going to account for the fact that if you have 
some very small occupancies in certain energy eigenstates, the effective dimension is going to account for that. Uh, and as a limiting example, effective dimension equals one when you have your initial state is just an energy eigenstate, which evolves trivially and will never overlap with other energy eigenstates. And so you would expect it to never look like equilibrium. And restating that result, we say that the probability of seeing a difference in expectation values of any multi-time instrument on a process compared to an equilibrium process is small. So the effective dimension dominates both inside and outside the curly brackets here. And the only technical assumption on the dynamics is a very general result, but the only technical assumption is that the time independent Hamiltonian, which we assume has a finite spectrum, uh, has non-degenerate energy gaps. And this is not such a strong assumption for many body systems. And in fact, it can be loosened with further technical argument, which we are doing in a follow-up paper. And so what's a nice physical caveat of this, returning to the idea of non-Markovianity, is that non-Markovianity, as I explained earlier, can be quantified through temporal correlation functions. So you measure something at A minus and have a causal break on the system level. And how does that measurement result affect future measurement results through the transfer of quantum memory? And what our equilibration result says is that the amount of non-Markovianity of a dynamical process is equal is is very close to the non-Markovianity of an equilibrium process for most times. So things look stationary, and we also numerically observe this for a spin coupled to a random matrix environment. And you can see how the non-Markovianity of a general process is getting closer and closer as effective dimension increases. But the key point is that the equilibrium process itself. Does, is not necessarily Markovian. So you can see how it has a fine, a small but finite non-Markovianity for this simple model. And this is a typical thing with equilibration. We, it, it, it's saying that things look stationary, but not necessarily that they look thermal. And this, in the quantum mechanical case, you can show in the single time case, that the similar result in terms of a quantum state is going to look equilibrium, but not necessarily like a Gibbs state, like a thermal ensemble, unless you have extra assumptions such as the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And so in the process case, we can say, okay, it's an open question of when this equilibrium process is in fact a Markov process. That would be an extra step that would require additional assumptions on, say, the dynamics. So in summary, the problem we're generally concerned with is how statistical mechanics derives from quantum mechanics. Temporal correlation functions can tell us a lot about the dynamics, which we can compute from this object called the process tensor. And that, yeah, in general contains more information about the dynamics of the system, such as the degree of non markovian The main result says the processes look equilibrium for most times and for typically large effective dimension, many body systems. This means that multi-time features, including the non-Markovianity of a process, look equilibrium slash stationary. And, but then it is an extra step to say, okay, when is that equilibrium process in fact a Markov process? And I'd just like to quickly point out this, so it doesn't seem like a paradox, why does everything look like equilibrium? This doesn't discount non-equilibrium things from happening. And so if you say quench a quantum system out of equilibrium and measure it immediately, of course, it won't look like equilibrium. But if you think about the, the complete timeline of the dynamics of some isolated quantum system, the time it spends out of equilibrium is very small, and the deviations from equilibrium are small on average over that whole period. So a visualization would be something like this. Um, OK, thanks for listening. Is there any quick questions before we move on to Ramis? Yeah, thank you, Neil. Uh, and I think we can uh, afford uh, one quick questions. Um, 
there's uh, no questions as well for your nice presentation. And if you have more questions, please just feel free to contact him. Um, and now let's switch to the second half of this talk. Hi, uh, you see my... Uh... Yes, I, I, I saw it. Yeah, now it should be... I don't know, this is... What are you saying? You're saying full screen? Okay, now I, I, I saw this, um, your slides in full screen. Okay. okay. Great, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, it's, a great, it's great to be here giving this talk. So although the two talks have been merged, uh, there are two disjoint results. I mean, what we have in mind by quantum processes are somewhat different. It was a very interesting talk I just heard, but uh, you don't need the previous talk for this talk. So it's called Theory of Ergodic Quantum Processes. Uh, I'm Ramin Smobasa from IBM Quantum Research, and this is a joint work with my colleague Jeffrey Schenker, who's a professor of mathematics at uh, Michigan State University. Uh, these are two references. So uh, there is a PRX paper coming out, and this is a, you know, more mathemat the mathematics and proofs can be found in this um, paper on archive. So since the time is short, I'll just tell you what I mean by a quantum process and tell you what, so the title says, here are ergodic quantum processes. So I'll tell you what I mean by quantum processes, I'll tell you what I mean by ergodic, and then uh, give you the results. So a quantum process is basically anything, any change to the state of a state row, row being a density matrix of a quantum system, this could be steps in the quantum computation, internal dynamics, interactions with the environment, or what have you. So all of these we call quantum processes. As a matter of fact, any process, any such process um, at a given time step is modeled by a quantum channel. You, you all know that, you know, if you have a discrete time quantum process, rho becomes phi of rho, where phi is some channel. Um, and in this talk, I'll be actually uh, considering discrete quantum processes. So these are discrete times. So I'm not going to think about, you know, a particle moving in, a, in space, but rather, you know, things like quantum channels, but anything that a quantum channel can model. So discrete quantum processes are finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So we're not going to consider infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And as you may know, quantum processes are mathematically modeled by sequence of quantum channels. Uh, that is, if certain things, so if rho is the initial state and uh, a process that takes n steps uh, takes place, then the result, the final state, will be a composition of these bounds applied to the initial state rho. So any sequence of quantum channels will be a channel, and that is a discrete quantum process. And all quantum processes can be described by composition of such channels, from measurement to decoherence to what have you. So having told you what I mean by quantum process, which I recap is just any channel, any sequence of channels that you can apply to a initial state. I want to tell you what I mean by ergodic. You might remember from statistical physics or maybe, maybe thermodynamics or mathematics that ergodicity means time averages are equal to ensemble averages. In particular, suppose you have a probability space here shown in omega. So these are set of events. The usual, you know, that every point has uh, any, any subset has some value probability attached to it between 0 and 1. The total sum is 1. This is a probability space. And these are some times. Suppose now you have a process on this. So that if at time equals 0, you know, this is the value. Right? At time equals one is this. So this is some process that happens in this probability space taking you from one event to another. And as a matter of fact, this process could be an ergodic process, maybe before showing you. So suppose this process is an ergodic process. And by that, it would mean that it's for a very long time, uh, you would explore most of this space. That is, if you spend infinite amount of time, these trajectories, any point on this probability space will be uh, approached by the trajectory very closely. That is with full measure, to use mathematical jargon. 
Now, this is a dynamical process. It has nothing to do with quantum channels. It's a purely uh, ergodic process in, in uh, probability theory. But we want to talk about ergodic quantum channels. Now, suppose this is a space of quantum channels. So these are space of operators that take density matrices, density matrices. And consider a map that takes a point from this probability space to a point in this quantum channel space. So if the underlying, so this map, call it phi, it takes a point at T0, it gives you this quantum channel, T1 gives you that quantum channel, etc. So you see that any underlying process, and in particular any underlying ergodic process, induces another process in uh, the space of quantum channels, which is not hard to see that will also be ergodic. That is, it will, ergodicity mathematically is very well defined. It's, uh, you can talk in terms of maps that are inverse as being measurable, etc. So th this process will also be, formally speaking, an ergodic process. So you have a process in the space of channels that takes you from one channel to another, and it's also ergodic. Now, over a very long time, although you might exhaust, you get very close to all the points in the probability space. That does not necessarily mean that here you will necessarily get close to every point in this uh, space of all channels. Because it could very well be that the whole space, whole probability space, gets mapped onto a fiber or some subset of all quantum channels. And if that is the case, you will get very close to every point within that fiber or within that subset. But that doesn't mean, you know, everybody here necessarily maps to everybody out here and vice versa. That's a minor detail. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, an ergodic quantum process in the space of channels does not necessarily mean you explore or full space of quantum channels, but there will be a subset, which is the image of this probability space that will be explored ergodically. Now, notion of ergodicity, I mean, um, you know, if you take channels randomly and independently, so IID channels, that would be a subset of ergodicity. But to use the theme of the conference, ergodicity goes beyond IID, and it goes to include translationally invariant channels, quasi-periodic maps, and much more. So this is this band diagram is exaggerated. Um, ergodicity is just a vast, vast generalization of all these little particular cases. So indeed, what we want to consider in this talk is a sequence of ergodic channels and, say, prove some theorems about what happens if you start with a state and you have a sequence of ergodic channels. What will be the output state? To tell you that, so I'm going to tell you about results now. So I've defined ergodic quantum channels, uh, quantum channels and ergodicity, and I've told you what I mean by sequence of uh, channels that is ergodic. So let me just start with some illustration. So this is a result of a MATLAB code. So these are block spheres. These are four independent experiments. And you have an amplitude damping channel. The plus is, OK, let's start here. The plus is the initial state on the block sphere. It's a pure state. And you apply the same channel over and over with a little bit of decoherence. And what happens is that so this is transition invariant, which is also ergodic. Um, the state slowly goes towards the center. And you can, the, the legend has it that um, on, the, on the sphere, it's dark. And as you get to the center, it gets lighter. So this point just moves inside. Here's a quasi-periodic sequence. So for amplitude damping channels, I guess detail, you don't have to know the details, but there's an angle. And this, this angle, if you take it incommensurate with respect to 2 pi, that is, it does not come back you get a quasi-periodic uh, sequence of angles. And what happens is that the, uh, as you can see, the state will go towards the center, but it will not reach a point. It will just spend a lot of time in some area around close to the center, not necessarily at the center. Here, it's a case that you take that angle of the amplitude damping channel from a Markov process. So you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you take a step you take an angle delta, little delta, and if it's tails, you don't do anything, and you keep doing this. And interestingly enough, if you start here, you know, you come back. I mean, you spend some time very near the center, but you also come back a lot. So it's, 
uh, the state does not just necessarily go towards the center, it explores a uh, larger area or larger set of possibilities. And it's, it's, interestingly enough, there's a topology um, which we'll not get into today. And if you have random independent angles, so these angles you just pick a random plane uniformly from 0 to 2 pi, but you're starting here, you just do a random walk and you kind of end up inside and you continue doing the random walk. So it's just an illustration um, that hopefully will attract your attention. And now I want to tell you the theorems. So in order to tell you the theorems, first I want to tell you what's the underlying assumption that enables us uh, to get these theorems. So our only assumption is that with probability one, that is almost surely, there exists an integer n0 greater than zero, such that for all n greater than n0, the composition of maps phi n all the way to phi zero is strictly positive. What does that mean? All this means is that this sequence with probability one will take any density matrix and will output uh, a density matrix that has only positive eigenvalues, no zeros. And this is to rule out the so-called selection rules. So once you have a completely positive map, you can make transitions from any state to any other state. And it also rules out um, transient states. So these are like um, subspaces of the Hilbert space where you can make all sorts of transitions to, but there's some symmetry that prevents you from going from this subspace to another subspace. For example, if the process has to do with emitting and absorbing a photon in a molecule, you can only change the angular momentum by integer values. And if your state happens to be a half integer uh, initial state, well, you'll remain half integer and you will not explore the set of integer angular momentums. So that would be, so you want to rule out these things and, and allow transitions between all sorts of states in the Hilbert space. And that's ensured by this probability one strict positivity. So that's the only assumption. And the theorem we prove is that, so consider, so the first theorem the, for general channels is an ergodic theorem for quantum processes, which I remind you that are represented by sequence of quantum channels quite formally and always. Consider an ergodic process satisfying the assumption I just stated. Then there exists an ergodic sequence of density matrices, Z1 to Zn, such that this sequence of channels apply to any initial state, whatever initial state might be, gets exponentially close. So the output of these channels get exponentially close to this ergodic sequence of density matrices or states. C is, a universe, C is some constant, mu is um, a constant less than one. So you, know, you see that's why there's an exponential uh, uh, convergence because you know, this goes to zero exponentially geometrically. Uh, and this happens for any row and with probability one. What is important to note here is that this sequence Z ends, this uh, ergodic sequence of states only depends on the sequence of channels and does not depend on the initial state that you start with. So regardless of where you start with, uh, with probability one, you will go to the sequence. And that sequence is only a function of uh, phi's. Now one application, somewhat, I guess you could say somewhat of an application, but there's a second theorem coming. Um, if you have work, so let me first introduce matrix probability states. If you have a spin chain, for example, and there are d states per site, so d equals two for electrons, uh, you can write the quantum state of this spin chain, the pure state of this spin chain. But actually, I guess this picture is not quite faithful because I'm taking a trace, so I'm imposing a periodic boundary condition. Um, this chain looks like an open, open chain, in which case, I mean, you can still make this work, but this would have to become a row vector and this would become a column vector and there wouldn't be a trace. And there's a way to keep that trace by appropriately defining these. But um, in any event, that's red herring and is unimportant. This, the matrix product state is a representation of the state on these spins, which has the following form. So these are the spin states. I, I label them from minus n to n. So this takes d values, this takes d values, etc. And this is a product of 
matrices, and therefore matrix product states, and it can take a trace. So this is the, for any given spin configuration, this number will be the weight, uh, weight in the superposition of this particular pure state. So you might ask, you know, if this sequence of matrices are an ergodic sequence, so previously the only results available for matrix product states were when all these matrices are the same, and there was some work if you took an IID, you know, independently and identically distributed from some ensemble, which are very, very special subclasses of, you know, our theory, in which the A's can be, the A's are an ergodic sequence, and in particular, maybe something I should have mentioned, if you have an ergodic sequence, they can be correlated. You could have long-range correlation between things. Uh, by no means, they need to be independent and identically distributed. Now, if you have an ergodic matrix product state, that is, these A's are from an ergodic sequence, can we say something? Can we quantify the expectation values? Can we quantify the correlation functions? The answer is yes. Whoops, what happened? The answer is yes. So let me uh, define the expectation value with respect to matrix product state of a local observable to be W of O, the limit of size going to infinity. So before telling you the theorem, uh, we derive expressions for the expectation values, which I'm not going to show you because the talk is very short and I don't want to flash too many formulas. Uh, but we have explicit formulas for expectation values, and we can use them to calculate, you know, entang full entanglement spectrum from which you can get Rennie entanglement, uh, von Neumann entanglement entropy, etc., across any cut. And this was a big open problem that whether, you know, we know for translation invariant case, the two-point correlation functions in a matrix product state can decay exponentially fast. But this was not extended to a more general setting where, where these matrices are not all equal. So we proved that there exists a mu, again, less than one, greater than zero, so something less than one, and a constant, such that for any two local observables, O1 and O2, so you know, they can be sitting somewhere in the chain, the two-point correlation function um, is exponentially small. That is, if you have these two local observables, the correlation between them is exponentially small. And in mathematics, W, which remember is just this, it's the expectation value of O1 times O2, where O1 is at the position on the chain X, and O2 is at the position X plus L. So distance is L from it. So the distance between the two observables is L. So this two-point function, which is the connected component, the disc, uh, this is the full uh, correlation function, and you subtract from it the disconnected component. Uh, which is the expectation of O1 times expectation of O2 at its appropriate position. This gives you the two-point correlation function or the so-called connected component if you're a particle basis. And this difference is less than um, a constant times something that's smaller than one to the L. So there's geometric convergence again. So indeed, the two-point correlation function is exponentially decay. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but uh, this may be a good place to stop. So there are plenty of new, plenty of open problems that I will not be able to get into today, but I invite you to take a look at these references if you're interested. Uh, for physical consequences, some consequences are that, you know, we can prove that Ploquet systems are only metastable um, if you have some decoherence. Um, that you can never have, you know, you know, fully stable topological phases using driven Floquet systems, and so forth. But I invite you to take a look at these uh, uh, more discussions of the theory. And I did not show all of the theory. I mean, there are more theorems and results. So there are actually three theorems in the paper and some corollaries, but I only showed you the main uh, main players. But, you know, you're welcome to take a look at them. And I'm happy to talk in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ramens. Um, I believe this is a very beautiful work. Um, but uh, due to thank the time you. limit, uh, let's just have uh, one quick question. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for a nice talk. Can, can I ask a question about your theorem one? 
basically. You want me to go to theorem one? Yeah, um, I can basically ask how you decide this state Zn depending on your channel. Oh. Yeah, it's so there is a our existence. What do you mean? I mean the is, last is, one. Yes, yes, the last remark. Yeah. So the question is, how do you get Zs, right? Yes. Yes. So we know. Um, the z's are related by a shift equation. So you can see it in the paper. So if you have a given z0, you can obtain all of them. It's an ergodic sequence, and these shift equations depend on phi's. So therefore, you can solve them. Now, finding the initial z0, um, the existence is guaranteed. But per case, I mean, if you look at, uh, we, for example, solved it for the case of uh, sections of R. So if you have uh, uh, R channels. These are like channels that are almost, they're like isometries, random isometries. We explicitly solve them. And um, so, yeah, you can explicitly solve them. And once you have the initial one, they're related by a shift equation. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, thank you, Ramis. I guess we have to move on for the next talk. Um, and if you have any more questions, please just contact Premise directly, okay?